Well, good morning. Good morning to the Norwich campus. Good morning to the Newport News campus. Good morning to Kingsway campus. I'm so excited that I get to be preaching to three churches. You know, uh, we have a we just started a church recently in the last year, Nations Church, and we're going to be, you know, doing different campuses in Orlando. And our vision is this to do the same exact thing. So I know it's wisdom from the Lord because there are special times and special services that you need to be able to just speak to everybody across the body. So I'm so thankful to be in a house that is moving, you know, that is adapting to the culture and that is reaching, you know, the next generation. So my name is Evangelist Joe Turnbull. I work at Christ for All Nations. Uh, because of what is happening here in Williamsburg and cities that are already asking us to come to the next city to do gospel crusades because of what they've heard here, uh, they've given me a new role as the USA Outreach Director. So that's the new role that I have now. It's awesome. It's really exciting. And uh, so we've been in ministry for over 40 years. It was founded by evangelist Reinhard Bunke and now evangelist Daniel Kalinda. He is the successor of Christ for All Nations. It's really beautiful that you see, you know, the vision passed down from generation to generation. You know, we really believe at Christ for All Nations that when a man receives a vision from God, that it's transcended to different generations. You know, because when Evangelist Reinhard Bunke, when he started in Africa, he heard of, you know, had a vision of a blood-washed Africa. And what he wanted to see is, you know, Africa shall be saved from Cape Town to Cairo. Well, Evangelist Reinhard, you know, Bunke, he passed away just a few years ago. He died at the age of 79. And we, right at that moment, had 79 million decisions for Jesus. And you're like, Joe, wow, you're throwing out these huge numbers, 83 million decisions for Christ, 79 million decisions for Christ. You know, we're seeing on a daily rate from week to week at Christ for All Nations, we're seeing anywhere from 10 to 20,000 decisions for Christ. And you might be thinking in your head, how in the world is that possible? And instead of trying to explain it to you, I would just like to show you. In the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you may heal broken marriages, that you may heal broken families in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the answer for this nation. Jesus is the answer for Africa. Say amen!
You know, there's 54 countries in Africa, but Christ for all nations, we have been yet, we've been banned from six countries. Evangelist Reinhard Bunke, he got off a plane in Cairo, Egypt, and they arrested him on spot. And he knew this when he was going, but he said, I must go because the Lord told me to go. And when I landed in Norfolk Airport just two days ago, I got an update on my phone that a Christ for All Nations boot camp graduate has done a crusade in Cairo, Egypt just yesterday. Over 20,000 Muslims heard the gospel. Just a few weeks ago, I was in the DRC Congo, and uh, you know, I was able to preach, I was able to minister, and uh, just over 21,000 decisions for Christ in five days. I really hope the Kingsway uh, campus is clapping as loud. I hope the Newport News' campus is clapping loud, because God is doing something across the world. I know you're used to hearing CNN, you're used to hearing Fox News, you're used to hearing bad things, but let me tell you what season it is. It is not COVID season, it is not restriction season, it is harvest season in the world. But how many people know that America needs the gospel? And that's why we're here in Williamsburg. That's why we're here in Jamestown, reaching out to the whole peninsula. Because we believe that in this area, if we lift Jesus high, that he'll draw all men. Many people will say, how do you get masses and crowds of people? And it's not just Africa. We have a gospel truck in Thailand right now that just saw over 8,000 people gather to hear the gospel. We're touching, down, touching ground in South America right now. And right now we're about to touch ground right here in North America. And you say, Joe, what's the secret? The secret is this. The Bible says in John 12, 32, it says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. It is that simple. When you lift Jesus high in a community, unity happens. The gospel happens. Transformation of a city happens. You know, when I first came here, they, you know, I, people came up to me, they're like, you know, Evangelist Doe, do you think the, the pastors and the churches will unite in the, you know, city of Williamsburg and in the peninsula? I said, you know, I don't really know the answer to that question, but every city that I've been to, when I begin to lift the name of Jesus high, when I stop worrying about the problems, the gossip, what this church did, what that church did, when I keep the main thing, the main thing, and that's that Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he wants to save the lost in this community, and we need to lift him up high, he will draw all men unto you, unto him. And what's such a blessing about this is we've had, you know, multiple outreaches over the last two months, and we've seen Anglican churches come out, Baptist churches come out, Pentecostal churches come out, non-denominational churches come out. We're seeing unity in the body of Christ like never before. Just a few weeks ago, we sent out over 110 people into the streets of Williamsburg around the surrounding neighborhoods to preach the gospel. And if you're one of those people that went out, just raise your hand real quick. Just raise your hand. Oh, man, that's amazing. See all the hands raised up? It's because of these people that we will see a field filled out there in Williamsburg. You see, Christ for All Nations isn't a great ministry because we have a great evangelist or we have great methods. You know, we have all this. Christ for All Nations has seen 83 million decisions for Christ because the church in Africa decided to take a stand. It was the pastors willing to come together, willing to work, willing to hear strategy, willing to hear our method and saying, hey, we're with you, and we're going to lock arms with you. That's why I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful for Pastor Mark that he's just willing to lay down his agenda to see people saved in his city. Pastor Pam, she was out there. She came up with her tennis shoes. She had her jeans on, T-shirt. She came out yesterday, and she's walking. She's knocking on doors. She's telling people about Jesus, telling people about the event. I was like, Man, for a pastor's wife to be out here, I was like, God is doing something in this city and in this town. I'm so excited for that. And just this past weekend, we've been in multiple churches. We're taking churches out individually. We're training them up in evangelism, not just corporately for unity. We've done multiple outreaches, and I'm really excited. You know, I talked to Pastor Mark last night, and we were talking about building a crosswalk evangelism outreach team. 
Because guess what? When I came here a few weeks ago and he was talking about the fivefold, how we've done pastors and we've done teachers, you know, but we've really, you know, we really need to work on the evangelist, the prophetic, you know, and everything. To hear a word from the Lord this morning, you know, that was such a precious moment. Such a precious moment. And we're going to see evangelism not only in October, but in November, in December, in January, in February, in March. We're going to see lost people saved coming to this church. Just today, we have a young man that was from uh, outreach this weekend. You know, he just re decided to rededicate just to follow Christ. And just wave your hand real quick, sir. Right? Wave your hand. He's right there. We don't fill fields to get good pictures. We fill fields to fill the church. That's why we're in so early is to partner with the pastors, you know, to partner with everything. And I'm just so blessed to be here um, in this community, in this town. And uh, my wife and kids are coming soon. I'm married. My wife is Krista. I have a five-year-old little girl named Julia. I have a three-year-old little boy. And they're going to be coming here. We're going to be spending weeks here, you know, in the area, just connecting, evangelizing, even more training up more churches. Because guess what? People need the gospel in this town. I was up last night, and I was, I was doing some research. There's only 40% 40 per, 40 of people that are religious in this town and in this area. And that's including all religions. And just because you go out and someone says, yeah, I know Jesus, that doesn't mean they're saved. When I talk about lifting the gospel high in a community, lifting Jesus high in a community, I'm not talking about just a watered-down gospel. I'm talking about a gospel that costs something. See, many people pray and they want to see revival. They want to see awakening. They want to see cities transformed. They want to see something happen in their town. But let me tell you one thing. There is a price to pay for that reward. There is a price to pay when you receive the gospel. There is a price to pay when you start to follow Jesus. You see, it's not a prayer where you filled out a card and then you get connected to a church and you become a part of a community and a family. Many people are doing that in many different se segments. I have friends, they have great community, they have great family, they go, to, you know, they go to the football game on Sunday, they drink a lot of beer, they have a lot of fun, they hang out, they watch each other kids, that, you know, they call that their community. They call that their family. What I'm talking about is a biblical perspective of what family is, what community is, when you're living a life for the gospel. The gospel that takes dead men and brings them to life. You see, we're not called to a community, you know, a country club. We're not called just to come hang out and tip God on our daily basis and serve one hour a week. We're called to call to live a life transformed, where we're not only preaching the gospel with our words, but with our actions in the workplace, where we're preaching the gospel in our families. You want to know why your families have problems? It's because you're not lifting up Jesus in your family. It's because men aren't sitting down with their wives and reading the Bible. They're not teaching their kids. You see, the five-fold ministry was designed for one thing, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You know, Evangelist Daniel Clinton always explained it as if it was, you know, a soccer game that's happening. You know, and many people think, you know, the, the pastor, the evangelist, they're the superstar, the apostle, the teacher. They're the ones going out there, passing the ball, kicking and scoring, and the rest of the church is cheering. Woo, go pastor. It's really awesome what you guys are doing. No. The fivefold ministry is called to be the water boys on the sideline. And the church body is the one playing. They're the one scoring the goals. They're the one passing the ball. And then when they're feeling a little bit down, they need a little bit of encouragement. Here comes Pastor Mark with his water bottle. Here you go. You need a little water this morning, Newport News? <laughs> you need a little water this morning, Kingsway? Who needs some water this morning? Who's been feeling a little dry? Let me tell you something. There is a drink, there is a well in this house, and it runs deep. And if you are thirsty, he is going to pour it out on you this morning. If you say, Joe, what can I expect today? Expect the Holy Spirit to move. But there's a price. There's a cost. 
You can't just expect to show up on Sunday morning for two hours and it lasts you the whole week. You know, many people ask me, you know, you travel a lot. You do a lot. You know, I see you here. I see you in Congo. We were just in Orlando. Literally just a few days ago, I was in Pensacola, Pensacola where 40 pastors met for a city-wide gospel event in their city. And it's because we're lifting and we're living a life from the gospel, from a biblical perspective of what family looks like. You say, Joe, what does that even mean? Well, better yet than I tell you, let me read it to you. Because it's the Bible that's true. It's not my opinion. It's not a Christian book, self-help, you know, about let your life be balanced. <laughs> you know, we throw these words around very loosely in these days, you know, come be a part of our family, come be a part of our community, feel welcome. It's not a self-help book. It is a book that will, when you read it, it will cut deep. And it will, it will contend with your heart to do something that you're uncomfortable with. I want to open up to what Jesus says about family in Matthew chapter 10. We're going to read uh, verse 37. And we're going to read 38 because how many people know that the word of God preaches better than Joe Turnbull? Hallelujah. If, you've just, uh, if you have your Bibles, just raise your Bibles real quick. Or just put your Bibles up in the air. Come on now. If your phone's your Bible, put it up in the air. If you're not raising one, we're going to pray for you to get saved at the end of the service. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Matthew 10, verse 37 and 38, it says this. He who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me family you see there's a price to pay when you want to see a city transform there's a price to pay when you see when to want to see a nation get changed it's not going to happen from you sitting up and watching the news and then posting on facebook about what you think it's going to be about you spending extra time with the lord you laying down your life, saying, hey, I'm going to go on an outreach. I'm going to be a part of this outreach evangelism team at Crosswalk. I'm actually going to go win the loss, and I'm going to make disciples. Because let me tell you something. You're not a follower of Christ if you're not making disciples. And evangelist Reinhard Bunke, evangelist Daniel Kalinda, many of the people that you see at CFAN, they pay a price. Sometimes I just go weeks without seeing my daughter or my kids or my family. People are like, man, you know, you just really got to balance your life. I'm like, yeah, but he's called me. There's people dying. There's cities that need to be transformed. And when God calls you to an area, when God tells you to stretch out a little bit more, to do a little bit more, guess what happens? The grace of God falls upon you, falls upon your family, falls upon your children. What Jesus is saying here, he's not saying, hey, just forget your family and run and go preach the gospel and never talk about them again. Paul had addressed that later in the Bible and it says, you know, if you don't provide for your family, you know you're worse than an unbeliever. That's not what he's saying, but what he's saying is if you're just working day in and day out to provide your family a better life, to buy, you know, to, to fulfill your family in the next step for your children, but you're not preaching the kingdom, you're not advancing the gospel, that you're not seeing the lost get saved in your city, that you're not serving in your local church because you're so worried about having enough money for your family for the next best thing. And when you get together, you just celebrate like, man, my kid got out of college and everything is paid for. Yeah, but does your kid know Jesus? Does he hear the word of the Lord? Did God tell him to go to that college? That's family from a biblical perspective. And when we say, hey, man, we just really want you to be a part of our family, what kind of family is that? What kind of church is that that is just, you know, grafting people in and they're just having barbecues and just, you know, singing kumbaya songs and they're like, man, I really feel the presence of God. This is awesome. The church is not a cruise ship. The church is a battleship and we're in a war like never before. 
You wonder why God isn't in our schools? It's because we're not raising our kids up to preach Jesus in our schools. We're sitting around, we're blaming legislation, we're blaming all these problems, but there's one person that we need to look at, and that's us. If Jesus isn't in the schools, if it's not in our government, if it's not in the workplace, guess who's to blame? The church of God. I've been in countries where the gospel is illegal. I've been to Pakistan. I've preached to the multitudes. If you convert a Christian there, they can kill you. There's a price to pay. And we've gone too, we've gone, we've gone too comfortable. We just want to be a part of a community that gets along and we want to talk about our, our daily problems. And these are good things to talk about if we're answering it from Jesus. You know, when we look at community from a biblical perspective in the book of Acts and see what Jesus and how the community in the book of Acts live, that's how we're supposed to be living our life. The word Bible is basic instruction before leaving earth. When we read this Bible, it's teaching us, it's showing us what the church looked like. You know, is it going to look like that we're going to be hiding in house churches? Thank God that we don't have to. Thank God we don't have to. But what it talks about is the principles that you apply to your life and the culture that you live in. And community from a biblical standpoint, you know, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, when there was a great awakening and the Spirit came, Jesus pulled his saints together and they formed community. But community from a biblical standpoint. And what did that community look like? I'd rather just tell you what the Bible says than tell you my, uh, my thoughts and opinions too many people are preaching their opinions. Too many people are preaching their thoughts these days. The word of God needs to be preached and the gospel needs to be lifted high. And I promise if you start doing that, you'll see transformation. So we're going to turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Real quickly, real quickly. Hallelujah. Norwich campus, are you uh, turning your Bibles there? Newport News campus, turn your Bibles there. I don't know, I, see some, I think I might see somebody all the way from here in the Newport News that hasn't, you know, has their Bible, but they're not turning. If you could just turn your Bible quickly. This is kind of cool. This is kind of fun. Maybe we'll do crusades with a uh, simultaneous class, you know, in different countries. It'd be pretty awesome. Hallelujah, that'd be awesome. Evangelist Daniel Clinton would be happy. <laughs> so Acts 2.42, it says this, the community, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. That is community. Community that is advancing the kingdom of God. Community that the fear of the Lord that all comes over when they get together, they're getting filled by the Holy Spirit. And when they go out into the public, guess what they're seeing? Signs, wonders, and miracles. They're seeing the power of the gospel transform lives. There's a lot of different ways to preach the gospel. People come up with a lot of different methods, a lot of scripts. But let me tell you what saves. The power of the gospels leads men unto salvation. And you're like, Joe, maybe I'm not apostle of the Bible. I'm not apostle of the time. I don't know if God can do signs and wonders and miracles through me, but I'm here to tell you today, church, that signs and wonders follow those who believe. That is biblical. It is in the Bible. If you believe on Jesus, he wants to use you. He wants you to stretch out your hands. He wants to see you heal the sick. He wants to see you mend the brokenhearted. I've seen it so many times, so many times, that when we do evangelism trainings, people go out and they come back and they're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I prayed for this person. They started weeping, crying, God touched them, they got saved. And I'm just like, wow, yeah, it works. <laughs> and they've been in church for 15, 20 years. And it's not like a, a, a thing to condemn. That's why we come into communities. That's why we come into churches and we, you know, we teach, we train, we equip. Because guess what? To do, the work of, to do the work of your ministry, you must do what? Do the work of an evangelist. And you're like, Joe, man, I'm not an apostle. I don't have a ministry. Let me tell you one thing. Everyone has their own personal ministry. Everyone. 
If you are a mother, you are a minister, you're a minister to your children. You're supposed to be praying over your children at night, making sure they don't have nightmares, filling them with the Holy Spirit. You know, if you're in a workplace and you're working from day to day and everyone around you is grumbling and complaining, oh, man, I hate my boss. I hate this. I can't believe they came up with this new rule. You know, we're having to do that. Instead of grumbling and complaining with everyone else, you're a Christian. And guess what? You're a peculiar people. You're supposed to be unique. You're supposed to be different. Your character is supposed to preach the gospel. And when you're encouraging, when you're uplifting, when you're saying, hey, guys, you know, I don't think it's really a big deal. Let's just do this and let's keep, you know, let's just keep working hard. And there, and somebody comes up to you, hey, why are you always joyful? Why do you always have peace? Why are you always calm? And you can say, because I lift Jesus up in my life because the gospel reigns in my heart. And if you don't know him, you need to get to know him because he can change you. He can change this workplace. Man, God can do so much when we only do so little. That's what the best thing about the gospel is, is guess what? He did the hard part. He did the hard part. And you're like, man, Joe, I don't know if I have that personality. I don't, you know, it's the way I look. Let me tell you something. It's not about somebody's personality. It's not about anything like that. But guess what? If you preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5, that Jesus Christ, he lived a perfect life. He was buried three days and that he rose again. When you tell people that, it does something stirring in their hearts. They've been crying out, Abba, Father. And when you get to introduce them to the Father in such a personal way, you know, many of us, we bring people to church and we just hope Pastor Mark preaches the gospel and people get saved. And that's great because that's what we're used to. That's the method that we're used to knowing and the church has had to adapt to that. But in the early church with that community, you know, the way that they laid down their lives, you know, for their families, It was intended that we preach the gospel on the outside walls and people came in to what? Learn good doctrine. To be taught, trained, and equipped. That's why the gifting of the pastor and teacher is so strong in the house of the Lord. Because that's what it's intended before. But the gift of the evangelist, man, they need to be burning on the outside. And they need to be training and equipping others to do the work of the ministry. But many of us, we don't step into these things because guess what? There's a cost to be paid. It's time. You can't give something that you don't have. That's why I love the word that was spoken this morning. We can't do it with crumbs anymore. But we need to be intimate. We need to be spending time with Jesus. We need to be filled up. Guess what? You can't pour out if you're not filled up. You can't see change in your family if you're not spending time with Jesus. You can spend time with your pastor, and that's a great thing to get those talks, to, you know, have that 30-minute session. But if you don't spend another session with Jesus, he can do something so much quicker than we can. That's why we see the crowds and the sizes and the numbers that we see all over the world is because, guess what? We know that the Holy Spirit can do something way quicker than we can. And we yield, we learn, we lean into it. But there's a cost to be paid for that. Your time, your effort, your finances, you know, to build the kingdom of God. What are you living for? What are you spending everything on? You know, um, uh, Billy Graham, you know, he used to say two things. You could tell somebody, you can tell where somebody's heart's at by two things. Their schedule and their wallet. There's a cost. But you know what's so beautiful about Jesus? Is that the reward is greater than the cost. The reward when you walk into a city, when I was just in Congo, and you're getting off and people are running from the police because they're escorting you to the hotel and you ask your director, I'm asking him, I say, why are people running from the police? He said, because over the last few weeks, they've been going around, they've been, you know, pulling up children, they've been pulling up kids to go fight in the war. People pulling them up right off the streets, 19-year-old, 20-year-old boys. Be one of your son or daughters getting pulled up off the street. And I said, man, this isn't good for the crusade. Everybody's afraid to be outside. So I met with the the chief of police, and he gave me permission from the stage to say that anybody that steps on this field, it's a safe place and no one will be taken. By the last night, 42,000 people were on that field that heard that gospel. 
That's the reward, guys. And the greatest thing about God is this. The greatest thing about God is this, is that it's hard work, it's in a cost, and it's everything like that, and it's a reward. And you're like, man, Joe, do I have to leave everything? Do I have to get on a plane? Do I have to go to Africa? Do I have to lay down my complete life? Do I have to surrender everything? You know, like this community that I'm a part of, like, you know, what needs to change? The beautiful thing about Jesus is that not only does he give you the reward at the end, but he gives you a gift in the beginning to make it happen. It's not in your own power. It's not in your own strength. You're like, man, how do I surrender more? Very simple. Asking the Holy Spirit to do it in your heart. He does the work. It's the gift of God. He gives us a gift, and it's the Holy Spirit. And that what leads us to surrender. That's what sees city transformation. That's what can help your family, help your life. It's being filled by the Holy Spirit. It's like when you're running a race, you know, you're running for a prize, and you get a trophy at the end. That's the reward. But you need power before the race to get to the end. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in in Acts 1. He says he wants to fill us with his power. You see, the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, many, many different things, many people, you know, it's not a one-time act where you went into a back room and you felt the Holy Spirit one time and then, you know, you cried out in your private prayer language and, you know, you're like, man, I got it. It happened. I had that experience. And then you went off about your life. That's not what that is. This is what it is. This is about being continually filled by the Holy Spirit to manifest the kingdom of God to the world, to advance the kingdom of God in your life, in your community, so that the gospel in Jesus will be lifted up high. It's the same as goes with repentance. It's not a one-time thing where you filled out a car where you got, you know, water sprinkled on you as a forehead and you've been saved since you were a baby. It's about knowing that you've been wrong and that you've been week to week with your heart laid down before the king saying, I repent. I continue to follow you. Repentance isn't a one-time prayer. It's deciding with your life to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, running after him week after week, day after day, no matter what it looks like, no matter what your past is, no matter if you yelled at your wife this morning while you were getting ready, no matter if you got angry with your kids right now, that the blood of Jesus is enough, that he's slow to, that he's slow to anger, he's compassionate, he's merciful. I'm talking about the gospel that raises dead men to life that can transform you in every special way. But he didn't die just to get us into heaven. He died so that heaven could come into us. And that he sent us the helper, the Holy Spirit, the one to comfort us when we have to lay down our lives, our agendas. The Holy Spirit that empowers us when we have to preach the gospel to our neighbor. That gives us boldness when fear of man comes upon us and we're like, man, can I do it? No, you can't. But he can. That's the gospel. That's the Holy Spirit. You don't need a man to lay hands on you. You don't need a special preacher. You don't need a special moment. You don't need a special room. You need a moment between you and the Father. And when, when you ask, he receives. If that's you today, if you want to ask Jesus into your heart, not only into your heart, but if you want to ask him for that repentive heart, if you want to ask him to be filled with the spirit, I promise you right now that God, he will pour out your spirit in your life right now. If that's you, what I want you to do is I'd like you to stand to your feet. Jesus. That goes for you, the Newport News campus and the Kingsway campus. If that's you today, and you're like, man, I really want to follow Jesus with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind. And I just want a fresh touch. And I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost like never before. Just stand to your feet. Jesus wants to transform the lives this morning. He wants the gospel to be transformed. And I want you to just pray with me. 
Just say, dear Jesus, I ask you for forgiveness for my sins. Come into my heart. I make you Lord of my life. I'll follow you all of my days. And the second one, if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, doesn't take a long time, but if that's you, if you want to be brief, if you want another filling with the Holy Spirit, just stand to your feet right now. Just stand to your feet right now. He wants to touch you. He wants to touch you. God wants to be poured out in this place. Lift your hands up to heaven. Jesus. And just pray with me. And what you might feel is you might feel just a warm sensation like rivers of living water flowing from your belly out of your mouth that the Holy Spirit touches you in a new way. Just close your eyes. Don't look to your left. Don't look to your neighbor. At the other campuses, if that's you, I just want you to stand to your feet at this moment. Don't miss your moment of the Holy Spirit. And I just want you to pray with me. Just say, dear Jesus, I ask you, fill me with your Holy Spirit and your fire, God. Jesus, I pray right now that you touch every heart. Fill them, Lord, like rivers of living water from their belly right out of their mouths. I pray, Holy Ghost, stir in this place like never before. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, a fresh touch right now over the Newport News campus. Newport News campus, God is about to pour out right now. If that's you and you're standing up, lift your hands a little higher. Jesus, touch them right now. King's Way, God, right now, I pray, King's Way, fresh fire in that building. Wind of the Holy Spirit, right now, fill that place like never before. I pray for Crosswalk Church that a fresh, mighty wind of the Holy Spirit blows through this house and blows the roof off this place. I call the spirit of the evangelist. Come alive in this place. Come alive in this place. Apostles be raised up. I call the voice of the prophets to be raised right now. Pastors, teachers, mothers, fathers, Holy Ghost, every gifting right now be equipped for your saints. Flow like never before. Flow like never before. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah.